this, is this on? Yeah, we're good. Okay, I just want to make sure. Uh, welcome to the Humanities Forum, our regular Friday afternoon gathering where we uh, get to hear from people from all over the country with interesting and provocative pre presentations to make. And I'm looking for a really, forward to a really great one today. But before Professor Smith comes and introduced uh, our speaker for today, I just want to welcome you here. The, the Humanities Forum is an initiative of the Development of Western Civilization program started by Raymond Hain eight years ago? Five years ago? What? Today, this week it does. Um, started five years ago. Uh, I think it's been an enormously successful program, and we want to start by uh, thanking especially the Gladys Brooks Foundation, which has provided financial support for this um, effort. I also want to thank anyone who might be here in town for homecoming weekend. Uh, we might have some new people. If you are here, welcome. I'm glad you made it into uh, today's talk. Um, with no further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Smith, who is going to introduce our speaker. That good, Raymond? Yeah. Right. Okay. So it is my pleasure to introduce today's Humanities Forum speaker, Dr. Paul A. Gillia. Dr. Gillia is the George Lynn Cross Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Oklahoma, where he taught undergraduate and graduate courses for 38 years. Dr. Gillia received a bachelor's degree from Brooklyn College in 1974, relocating to Providence shortly thereafter to begin his graduate studies at Brown under the tutelage of Gordon Wood. After receiving his PhD in 1980, he moved to Norman, Oklahoma to take an assistant professorship at the University of Oklahoma, the state's flagship research university. At various points during his career, Dr. Gillia has held visiting professorships at New York University and the University of Glasgow. He's the author, of ele author or editor of 11 prize-winning books, two major encyclopedia collections, and nearly two dozen peer-reviewed book chapters and scholarly articles that have appeared in leading journals such as the Journal of the Early Republic, the William and Mary Quarterly, the Journal of Social History, New York History, and the Maryland Historical Magazine. He's long been an active and engaged scholar, writing dozens of book reviews and presenting his research at leading national conferences. Dr. Gillia has also received numerous grants and fellowships to support his research. He is currently working on a book about the year of 1800, while an, while an in residence senior research associate at the University of Pennsylvania's McNeil Center for Early American Studies. While Dr. Gillia is widely considered to be the leading expert on maritime culture in revolutionary America, his early work was concerned with how riotous crowds reflected the evolution of New York City's economy and society from the American imperial crisis to the age of Jackson. In his first book, the Road to Mobocracy, Dr. Gillia points out how crowd action evolved from a kind of unifying collective action to a far more malevolent force that revealed ever-widening social stratification in Jacksonian America. Mobs in Revolution America, Dr. Gillia tells us, often took out their frustrations on things that represented their frustrations, such as effigies, and stamp, effigies of stamp collectors, while limiting violent, action, violent actions against people and property. This kind of restraint began to erode in increasingly destructive waves in Andrew Jackson's America as crowds began targeting ethnic and racial minorities that reveals, Dr. Gillia argues, a deeply fractured social order. And that's a quote from the book. I wanted to emphasize that. After publishing several collaboratively edited books on New York City and a synthesis on the history of writing in America, Dr. Gillia began exploring the social, political, and cultural lives of sailors in Revolutionary America that culminated in his prize-winning 2004 book, Liberty on the Waterfront, American Maritime Culture in the Age of Revolution. In this book, Dr. Gillia suggests that sailors understood liberty as a tangible way of life that included elaborate shared social and cultural practices. Building on his earlier work, Dr. Gillia reveals how mariner-led anti-impressment riots influenced the political protests 
during the imperial crisis. We see Dr. Gilly expand on these themes in his 2008 presidential address to the Society of Histo for Historians of the Early American Republic, a talk that evolved into his 2013 book, Free Trade and Sailors' Rights, uh, Free Trade and Sailors' Rights in the War of 1812. Dr. Gilly remained captivated by sailors in early America, publishing To Swear Like a Sailor, Maritime Culture in America, 1750 to 1850, 1850 and 2016, after collaborating with William Pencak on their 2007 collection of essays, Pirates, Jack Tar, and Memory. Now on a more, more personal note, I'd like to add that Dr. Gilly's work has had a profound influence on my career. I cannot tell you how many times I've reached for my well-worn copies of The Road to Mobocracy, New York and the Age of the Constitution, and the New York Irish to follow up on a potential lead by scouring his meticulous footnotes and indices. To study the murky waters of New York or the lives and experiences of mariners in revolutionary America is to follow in Paul Gillia's footsteps. So thank you, Paul. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul A. Gillia to Providence College. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful introduction. I was afraid for a minute that he was going to summarize every one of my books, at which point I don't think I would have had much time to speak to you about my latest production, uh, which is uh, Cycles of Life. Uh, I'm going to talk to you most of the time, but I'm going to read a little bit, uh, read an introduction. When I get to the end, I'm going to read a little conclusion because I like the way I wrote it. But most of the time, I'll be talking to you uh, like this. So I thank all of you for being here. I, I thank the Humanities Forum uh, for asking me to come here. Um, so in 1968, amid the ordeal of the Vietnam War, after the assassination of, assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy, while the nation seethed with racial unrest and civil discord, and as protesters and police confronted each other on the streets of Chicago, three 17-year-old boys uh, there they are, uh, uh, three 17-year-old boys, um, almost oblivious to what was happening in the world, peddled their way up the Hudson Valley into northern New York and made their way to Canada just as they were beginning their senior year in high school. In the middle of the Me Too movement, while the nation debated a Supreme Court appointment that could decide the fate, uh, fate of Roe versus Wade and abortion rights in America. Um, as African Americans declared their, that black lives matter uh, and athletes knelt to demonstrate their support for equal rights, two old men followed in the path of those teenagers 50 years later. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about is those two trips. Um, talk to you about uh, my experience on those, on those two trips. This is a, most of my, almost all of my images are from the recent ride because, well, we can take pictures so much easier now with our phones uh, than we did in 1968. Uh, my, one of my colleagues, one of my riding partners, colleagues, sounds so official, 17 year olds don't have colleagues, uh, they have friends. <laughs> two year, too many years as an academic. Um, uh, one of my friends was a photographer. He took many pictures. Unfortunately, I was never able to contact him um, before the ride. But there I am in front of the house I grew up in uh, in Brooklyn on 76th Street. We have a Bay Ridgeite uh, who's from the same neighborhood in Brooklyn I, uh, I'm from. Uh, about four or five years ago, I came up with this idea. And I thought it was a brilliant idea. In retrospect, perhaps it wasn't so brilliant. I came up with this idea that I knew I'd I'd taken this ride when I was 17 years old, uh, and I thought, well, I'm 67. As I'm going to retire, maybe I should redo the ride. Uh, a ride from Brooklyn to Montreal, which we did the week before Labor Day uh, in six days uh, in 1968. Um, well, maybe it was a brilliant idea, as you'll see. Um, and then I came up with this idea of writing a book afterwards, uh, or actually in the process of training and afterwards. Uh, about the two experiences. And what this book is, uh, it is a memoir. That is, I talk about myself a lot, 
which is always easy to do. I passed this book I ever wrote, because uh, it's just a matter of making stuff up uh, from, my, from my memory. Um, it's a memoir of my world in 1968. It's a memoir of my experience of moving from the life of a regular professor to a professor emeritus, uh, from adult uh, adulthood to post-adulthood, I guess. Um, so it's a, it's, a, uh, so it's a memoir, it's a travelogue, but it's also a history. Uh, and I'm going to main, you'll, you'll hear some of the travelogue, you'll hear, you'll hear some of the, um, uh, what are we doing here? Okay, well give me the next slide. Uh, 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 but I'm mainly going to try to talk about history. I'm talking about history, I'm a trained professional. I, I, I am a professional. And as a professional, I always tend to think historically. Uh, and so the three sort of key concepts I'll be touching on throughout uh, my discussion with you today. Number one um, is what is history? History is the story of change and continuity through time. In my career at the University of Oklahoma, I calculated that I taught about 6,000 students. Uh, and everyone, every class that I taught with those 6,000 students, they heard me talk on and on. Without change, without things becoming different, there's no story to tell. Without continuity, there's no way of sort of tracing how the change comes along. Uh, so it's an interaction, it's the interplay between those two forces. And so we'll talk a little bit about that as I go through the ride and talk about some of the changes. Uh, but there's also another key concept, uh, is that the past is fundamentally different from the present. As an historian, I hear sometimes people say, all things never change. Politicians are politicians. You know, people are people. And that's just wrong. Uh, even in my lifetime, even for those of you who are younger here and some of those of you who are older here, you, you know, even in your lifetimes, things have changed. Uh, and the world was different 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. We'll be talking a lot about that. And sort of the third historical concept which is very important to me as a scholar, and really, when I look back through the last 40 years of studying history, uh, I realize uh, that I'm interested in the interaction of the individual and those forces that impinge upon the individual. And again, this is something I will be talking about in some detail. Cast of characters. I have to introduce myself. You could probably, hopefully, you could see which one I am. Um, I am the one over here. Uh, I had more hair, uh, but I was 17. Um, the other two individuals, uh, one person next to me was my friend Roger, and uh, the, the third one is Dennis. This is what we might call an old-fashioned selfie. Uh, that is, Dennis took the ca his camera, had a timer. We didn't have a tripod. So he put it on a hood of a car, and then you know started the timer, ran around, and we posed. Uh, so there's the uh, the three of us. Uh, again, this is right outside my parents' house. Uh, we spent the night at my parents' house the night before, and we're ready to go. Um, this is the cast of characters in 2018. Um, I I'd asked Roger to join me on the ride. I'd been in contact with Roger. I asked Roger to join me in the ride. Unfortunately, uh, he was so excited about the idea of doing the ride with me that his heart went all a flutter. Uh, unfortunately, that's called an AFib event, uh, and that really took him out of, out of the possibility. Uh, one of my running partners, I, we ran for, been running for 40, 50 years, I ran this morning. Um, uh, one of my running partners from Oak, the University of Oklahoma a young man of 60, uh, who is an engineering professor, uh, agreed to go uh, on the ride with me. Now, when you see pictures of the two of us, uh, you'll see that he's a little more rotund than I am, but he was also a much better biker. He was, that year, he biked somewhere between two and 3,000 miles. Um, and yeah, so, and even biking like that for years and years and years, and he could bike me into the ground. Um, which, by the way, was a lot easier than it might sound. Uh, there's me, there's our wives. Now our wives are an important part of the story because part of the idea of doing the ride when you're 17 is that we did it on a shoestring. And part of the idea of like, being able to do it when you're 67 is you no longer had to operate on a shoestring. 
um, that ROI, is, it, we, the three of us, uh, I have a picture of, of a pup tent we used uh, in 1968. Uh, in uh, 2018, Hampton Inns all the way. Uh, <laughs> Right? And, and at the end of every day, we called our wives. They came and picked us up uh, and drove us to the hotel. We showered. We ate at a restaurant. Uh, we slept in nice beds. Uh, you know, it, that was part of the difference, uh, the, the difference uh, between the experiences. So my wife, Anne, who's sitting next to me, uh, David's wife, Frances, sitting next to her. And uh, this, David is a small town Illinois boy. Uh, Frances, is as southern as southern can be. She grew up in Memphis. Uh, she was originally didn't want David to do the ride because she didn't want him to be on the road with all them Yankees. Uh, literally, that's what she said. Uh, but uh, we took him to a, a, our favorite Brooklyn pizza place and we shared a pizza uh, the night before, uh, before the ride. Uh, brief word about, I, I could go on, I have a whole chapter on equipment but I can go on and on about equipment, but a brief word uh, about equipment. So I had a bike that my dad had bought me in 1966 uh, for $43. Uh, it wasn't that fancy of a bike. It looks better than it was. Dennis and Roger uh, uh, were on a tandem, a bicycle built for two. Uh, I actually was very jealous of the two of them because they were together the whole time and I was off by myself. Um, I found out afterwards that they were arguing half the time about who was pedaling enough. Uh, but I did not know that at the time. Uh, our bikes on the left, uh, uh, David had a, uh, about a, you can spend a lot of money on bicycles today. Uh, David's bike was about $2,500, a Bianchi. It was a road bike, much better bike than I had. I, didn't, I bought a bike special for the trip. I didn't want a road bike. I didn't want those curved handlebars. They just did not go well with my body. You know, I didn't want, I don't like biking like this for too long. I, I wanted to sit upright. Uh, my bike cost about $2,000. Just an interesting comparison. Uh, you can also see something in, different to what in our attire. And I could go into lots of detail about the attire, but I won't. I will just simply say uh, that when I was emailing with Roger about it, Roger uh, sent me an email and he, uh, he said to me, he goes, well, back in those days, all we had were, right, uh, T-shirts, cut-off shorts, and tidy whiteies. Now, the only thing he was really right about, if you look at the picture, was the tidy whiteies, which highlights sort of the first sort of change or, or first historical point I want to make, which is something I refer to as the casual revolution. I could be really fancy and refer to it as the sartorial revolution, is that the way people dress uh, has changed dramatically over time in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, 50 years. Um, and in fact, well, we'll hold off on that. I'll show you a picture uh, first of people dressed back then. Um, and this is my high school senior picture. Uh, don't, identical, right? You can, hardly any difference, uh, hardly any difference at all. Uh, but in those days, a high school senior picture meant you with jacket and tie. Uh, the most interesting picture there for me is the upper, right? I have to get there. Um, that is the occupation of a hall at Columbia University in the spring of 1968. Look at the way those radical students are dressed. <laughs> there are a lot of professors today who don't dress as well as those radicals uh, did. Back, back in 1968. Um, and the transition is occurring just at this time, a big transition. And you can begin to see that in the picture below. By the time you get to Woodstock, I had to get that line in. If any of you know the music, you'll recognize uh, the line. That's Woodstock. Uh, but again, it's very interesting. If you look at that picture, I, I studied many images from Woodstock. Um, and you look at that. Now, there are young men without shirts. The young man who has his back to us is wearing really an undershirt. And if you can find other young men there who will have shirts on, they're not t-shirts. Because the t-shirt revolution, which is a part of the casual revolution, occurs basically late 60s, early 70s, and really hadn't hit very much at this time. Um, 
And this really, this one is one of those little changes, one of those little changes that we don't even think about. Uh, and today, people wear t-shirts for political reasons. I got the right and the left there, right? Do you see that? Uh, uh, I, have, I found a Providence College t-shirt, uh, University of Oklahoma t-shirts, and a, a, a recycling t-shirt. Uh, between technology, uh, between uh, the way this, this casual revolution, um, you know, all of these things come together with the t-shirt revolution. And I actually thought, sat down and thought about when was the first time I bought a t-shirt like for a, as a souvenir. And it wasn't until the 1980s, actually. I'd gotten some t-shirts from running in some races before then, but really, it wasn't until then. Um, and I'm actually kind of surprised, uh, looking out at the audience and looking at the students, that more of you aren't wearing t-shirts. At the University of Oklahoma, I, and I did this before I retired, I taught a class of about 200 students, and, uh, and I would say at least 50% of the students every day showed up in a t-shirt. Your dress here is a vast improvement. Of course, many of you are wearing sweatshirts. And it could have something to do with the fact that in Oklahoma today, the high is probably about 90. Uh, and the high today is about 60. Uh, so that might have an impact on that. But thank you, sir, uh, for having a t-shirt on. I, uh, <laughs> I'm saved. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight this as one of those changes. I could have talked about the sexual revolution. I could have talked about the drug revolution, but honestly, when I was 17, unfortunately, I had not really participated that much in either one of those revolutions. So I, will, I figured I'd talk about something that was more relevant. But there's the t-shirt uh, revolution. Um, well, oh, the other thing, pants, women wearing pants. Um, so this picture over here, I, I chose this picture for a couple of reasons here. Uh, look at the legs of the women you can see, young women you can see. This is a group from my high school yearbook. It's actually a group of juniors. I took this picture, I chose this picture purposely for several reasons. One, it's cold. And all the young women, you can see their legs, right? The ones that you can see the legs. And, and three, is this secret? This is the secret. My wife is in this picture. I didn't date her in high school, but there she is. Uh, one, two, three from the right with the scarf. That was, that's my wife, Anne. Um, um, so one of the radical movements that happened in my high school in uh, 1968 and 69 is that the women began to protest being forced, compelled, to wear skirts to school. Uh, in the wintertime, they wanted to wear pants because they draft. I don't know this from personal experience, but apparently you can get drafty wearing a dress when it's 25 degrees out. Uh, people in Providence probably know this very well. Um, and this became a big issue. And ultimately, the principal who said that wearing, a, wearing women wearing pants is too sexually suggestive. Look how short some of those skirts are. Four, five inches above the knee. Uh, what is more suggestive but, you know. Um, and of course, in 1968, it turns out, um, was when uh, designers began to uh, offer pantsuits for women to wear. Uh, and the person who made this most famous, of course, was Hillary Clinton. I know at the University of Oklahoma, all of my women colleagues on election day uh, showed up in pantsuits to celebrate uh, the election, the inevitable election of the first woman president. Uh, they were, and many of us were disappointed uh, in the end result. But uh, I just thought this is, again, a part of the casual revolution that we have experienced. Um, brief word about training. I just, the picture there is really for, to show you two things. One, I trained a lot uh, the summer before the ride. And in three months, I bicycled 1,200 miles, most of which was on the Schuylkill River Trail, which is, this is a piece of, you can see, that goes through Philadelphia. Uh, and there you can see the pup tent we used. Uh, this, uh, that's what we, we slept, the three of us slept in that. Uh, this was a, a, a practice run. We biked a, up to a camping ground near Bear Mountain, because obviously this is not winter, uh, not, actually not summer. Um, and we also realized we had brought way too much equipment. See that sleeping bag? <laughs> Hanging, that's my sleeping bag. <laughs> way too much equipment. Uh, we packed cans of Dinty More Beef Stew 
Dennis was going to cook the meal up in a, uh, in a metal skillet. <laughs> All of that we did away with. We went really uh, bare bones uh, thereafter, and that's Roger and myself. Day one. Uh, so each day I'll talk a little bit about the day, and I have a sort of a historical transition I want to talk about in relationship uh, to that day. And I, there's our, uh, the miles we did. Uh, the, the, the route that you see I, I traced on Google Maps is the route we did in, 19, uh, excuse me, in 2018. Uh, it pretty much paralleled, followed often the same route we did in 1968. We did some deviations. One of the deviations is that we did not in... Uh, in 2018, we did not go up through the middle of Manhattan. We went over to the west side and took a bike trail up because it was safer. Um, when I was 17, I didn't care about things like that. I took pride in the way I could cruise through the streets of Brooklyn and Manhattan on my bicycle. When I was 67, I was scared to death. Uh, one of those changes that happens in, uh, in your lives. And there are the two of us. Do you, know, do you recognize where that is? OK. She, she's from Bay Ridge, so my, my, my neighborhood, originally from Bay Ridge. And the other thing that's interesting about this is that we, in, in 2018, for the first two days, we outperformed our, my 17-year-old self. And the reason for that uh, was because uh, we had to, in 1968, we had to aim for a campground. And a lot depended where the campground was on the map. Whereas in 2018, it was just whenever we stopped, whipped out our cell phones, and texted or called our wives, and they came and picked us up. So we did quite well. It's 400 miles. The idea, the aim was to do, uh, the aim was to do 67 miles a day. We fell a little short that day, and there was a reason for that. Um, I made a mistake. I didn't hydrate enough. And uh, that did not, uh, and as you will see, one of the things that happened on the ride uh, was that we chose, it was a bad week. The weather, the week before Labor Day last year, not this, past, this year, but last year, uh, it was in a very, very intense heat wave. Uh, at the, third, the third and the fourth day, the heat index was well over 100, 103, 104. Uh, We'll talk more about that when we get to it. So what happens to me, um, we hit the, oops. oops, there's a, was, that's just us in Brooklyn, crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. What happens, uh, oh, I, did I get, I got, a, I got ahead of myself somehow. Can I go back? Day one. Oh, there it is. I'm going to go back to that other slide since I started telling this story. I'm not looking at my slides, so I'm just talking, and I just got ahead of my slides. Well, what's the headless horseman have to do with anything? And why am I laying on the ground next to a cemetery, which was the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery? So we got into the hills around Tarrytown, and I started struggling, and I needed to get off the bike. And I got off my bike, and I was going to lay, sit on this wall, and, uh, and suddenly I saw spots in front of my eyes. That's not a good sign. I've been there before. Uh, and then my heart started going thump, thump, thump. I actually went thump, 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 thump. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this is it. Uh, so I lay down, elevated my feet, got up. Same thing happened again. Lay down, elevated, hydrated three times, but not down from permanent for the count. Uh, this was about mile 54, 55 for the day. And we continued. No, it was actually about mile 50. Uh, so we continued for another 10 miles after, after this. Uh, so I like to say that you can either say, I almost saw the headless horseman, or I almost became the headless horseman, uh, depending on which way uh, you want to look at it. Uh, the historical transformation I wanted to talk about uh, is transportation. As a kid, uh, we, we, well, uh, in 2018, we crossed the Brooklyn Bridge. We went over to the west side, and we're biking up the west side. And I kept on thinking about the way the west side was when I was a child. It was, oh, it was an active uh, port with freighters 
uh, with um, not, that's not a the ship on the right, upper right hand is, uh, is an ocean liner. Uh, I can tell you what ocean liner that is, and there's a reason why it's there. Uh, that is the Stavanger Fjord, uh, which sounds very Norwegian, and it is. Uh, my dad emigrated to the United States in 1936 in the Stavanger Fjord. And when I was a kid, we'd go, always go up the um, West Side Highway, and we'd always look to see if the Stavanger Fjord was in port. Uh, that would be before 68, actually. The ship was scuttled in 66. A transformation in the way people traveled long distances, uh, no longer uh, cruise ships, uh, excuse me, ocean liners, uh, but instead um, airplanes. Uh, we do still have something like cruise ships, and you can see that in that picture there, which, uh, excuse me, uh, ocean liners, which is cruise ships. What I love about that picture is, and, and I wish we had taken the picture I, uh, at the time. I did not take the picture from the air, right? Uh, obviously. Uh, but there's a, there was, the cruise ship is actually bigger than the Intrepid Airspace Museum, which really speaks volumes for that. So that's one change. And part of that, uh, another change I wanted to just briefly mention is uh, the emergence of rails to trails. Uh, and the reason why there's rails to trails is because railroads have declined. Rails to trails are those paths built along bicycle paths, uh, like this one here, uh, and sort of like this one here, which is the west side. Uh, this is in Westchester County, uh, which um, one of the things that happen is, happens in the 1950s and 1960s is that the inter um, interstate uh, road system, highway system is built, trucks take over, and that kills the railroad industry. It doesn't that entirely. The railroad industry is still there, but in terms of carrying goods. It's the kind of transformation which has occurred in my life a little bit earlier than 60s, but I really thought about this when I was going up uh, the West Side Highway. So now I've already been there. I'm sorry. Uh, been there. Don't I look happy? <laughs> my brother saw that picture. Why are you smiling? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I told David to take the picture after I was recovering. You, know? uh, you don't get to see when I was really bad. Um, uh, this picture of David and I at the end of day two it's in Hudson, New York. I we, we purposely took this selfie because look at the, the uh, sign above us. Um, and again, we outperformed our, my 17-year-old self. We actually did 67 miles uh, that day. Uh, after I had the experience uh, on the first day, I was very careful. I walked up many more hills. I hydrated like crazy. Uh, hydration was not an issue. The heat became more and more of an issue as we went on. Uh, and, you can, and if you also notice, we climbed less, and that was intentional. We actually we did our first, as I refer to as cheating, that day. That is, we cut out some miles. Well, we had stopped in Peekskill the day before, which is on the Hudson River. Uh, and the six miles out of Peekskill are uphill. So we said, you know what? We'll start at the top of that hill. So we cut out six miles that, uh, 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 that day. That's the reason why the elevation is not as, as much as you would think. So what lesson are we going to learn about day two? Uh, air conditioning. I discovered today that Providence College has buildings which don't have air conditioning. I was, <laughs> I was in shock. Because <laughs> um, that's a major transformation that has occurred. And, and, and so the story is, we, uh, David and I would stop wherever we could go to air conditioning. Uh, we would, uh, so we were biking by Hyde Park, where FDR lived. Uh, and I remember doing this when I was a kid, but we didn't stop when I was a kid. And I said to David, David, I'm a big National Parks fan. I said, David, they've got great bathrooms in there. <laughs> Again, a difference between taking the ride when you're 17 and 67 is you think a lot about where you can find great bathrooms. <laughs> this, this, is, this is, I can see some of the people closer to my age going, yeah, I understand this one. <laughs> Uh, and so, and it was air conditioned. We went in. We used the facilities. We took some a nice selfie. About uh, so the the plan was that uh, when when David and I were on the trip, uh, uh, bicycling, Anne and Francis were touring. So they an hour after we were there, they came to the FDR house, 
Uh, and they went into the FDR house and did a tour. They were really excited about it. But then the park ranger said, you can't go upstairs. We can't take you upstairs because it's not air conditioned. And heat index was in the 90s at the time, closing at 100. And they don't want tourists to go up and collapse on them. Um, and then we met that night, and we were talking about that, which made me think about air conditioning. So here's some interesting things about air conditioning. Air conditioning was sort of modern air conditioning was invented in 1902. During the 1920s, movie houses began to have air conditioning so people could go pay money to go to the movies. During the 1930s, uh, some office buildings and stores began to have air conditioning. Uh, more, some private homes began to have air conditioning in the 1950s. Uh, but as late as 1965, only 15% of the homes in the United States have air conditioning. Putting aside Providence and Providence College, 85% uh, of the homes today, or in 2007 was when my statistics were from, had air conditioning. What does that mean? What is it? There, there, there are historical implications here that are really crucial. Um, one of the tremendous shifts, and this had a big impact on, on, on Providence, had a big impact on my father, it had a big impact on uh, the whole entire Northeast and Upper Midwest, is the shift of a population to the South. Uh, the sort of creation of the Rust Belt and the emergence of the Sun Belt. Impossible. Impossible without air conditioning. I lived in Oklahoma for 38 years. I, I once turned to a woman in, who was, this was when I was young, and she was probably about my age at the time. I said, what would you do when you were young without air conditioning? She said, oh, we used to wet the sheets and go to bed at night with wet sheets to stay cool. Um, uh, so this tremendous change in American society, this trem tremendous change in American culture, is a function of this air conditioning and the spread of air conditioning. It's, again, one of those things, you know, the, the big, big change, big social cultural change that has had a direct impact on our lives. And so you look at all the empty factories, uh, you know, are there still empty factories around here? Have they begun to fill up again? But when I was in graduate school uh, uh, in the uh, 1970s, you know, all the old wooden socket, all these, uh, uh, New Bedford, Fall, uh, Fall River, all these towns, huge old uh, uh, manufacturing buildings that were empty. And they were emptied in part because of air conditioning. It's, I think, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily think of that. Um, day three, six days. Just to let you know how far we are, right? So I'm pedaling up the hill. Um, I, doesn't that look like perfect place to bicycle? Every day on the trip, every day on the trip, there were these perfect moments. And every day on this trip, in both 1968 and 2018, there were less than perfect moments, uh, like when I collapsed. Um, so um, you, you can see there's a pretty significant difference. We, uh, cut out, we, we cut out more miles. Um, we only made about a little under 54 miles. And damn, excuse me, but damn, that 17-year-old me, he got stronger on the trip. Where the 67-year-old me got weaker on the trip. I can't figure out why. Uh, um, anyhow, so we say, one of the reasons why our mileage was so much greater, we didn't go for much further north. Uh, we started further south. We went, instead of going straight north to Albany, we bicycled to Schenectady. And we bicycled to Schenectady because Dennis had a, a new, the son of a man who, worked, who owned a delicatessen across the street from where he lived, who said he'd put us up for the night. A uh, young man, maybe late 20s, early 30s, uh, three young boys and, and a wife. Uh, he worked, he had moved up to this area to work in a factory. That's an important piece of information because the rust belt was beginning to rust. Uh, and so we got lost. 
Uh, we drove to Schenectady. He didn't really live in Schenectady. He lived east of Schenectady. So we got to his house about 10 o'clock at night. His wife, you know, they were waiting for us. The three boys were so excited to see us. They were like ages 11, 9, and 7. Um, you know, we pulled in at 10 o'clock at night. His wife makes us steak and eggs, and we're sitting there having steak and eggs. And I'll refer to this, this man whose house we were at. His name is Joe. Uh, he's ethnic, uh, ethnic Italian, uh, good, hardworking, working class man. We're sitting there eating, and he begins to regale us about his politics. Um, and um, in 1968, uh, it was a very contentious election. Uh, there was a third party candidate, uh, George Wallace. George Wallace had been a Democrat in the South uh, and uh, was a racist. Uh, and you can see his sign, stand up for America. Uh, and this was a period of incredible contention. Uh, the, turns out that the week, that, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to bicycle the same week of the year, this was the week of the Democratic National Convention. Uh, those are images from the uh, disturbances that accompanied the Chicago Convention. Uh, we were oblivious to this. He starts telling us about this, and he starts telling us about how he really admired George Wallace. And, and what did we do? Did we argue? Did we debate? We scarfed down steak and eggs. Um, but I, th I thought a lot about this for two reasons, because this is a very important moment in American history. Because uh, it's that up until 1968, the South always voted Democratic. Always. The shift of a solid Republican South, which is what we have now, this is where it's beginning. And Nixon ultimately capitalizes on, on that. Ronald Reagan capitalizes on that. Um, and of course, Donald Trump could count on that. But also, and this is where Joe comes into play, um, this is also, you know, union workers, factory workers used to be solidly democratic. And here was Joe admiring George Wallace. The same kind of thing leads to Nixon, leads to Reagan. And of course, it's people like Joe who in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan gave the election to Donald Trump. It's interesting, you know, there we were oblivious to all this politics, and there it was, the future of America. Um, what really made America great? Um, two images. Uh, one is of my father with three other men. Can you, you can probably tell from the picture over here which one is my father. He's the one all the way on your right. Um, my father was a machinist. He worked in a machine shop for 27 years. Um, why am I here? Because of my father. But not just because of my father. Because my father belonged to a union. And the union made sure that workers, like my father who worked in factories, could earn a living wage, could buy that house. My father owned that house in that picture. Um, could send his children to college, which enabled me to get a college education, which in turn enabled me to get my PhD, and that's my father and myself getting a PhD. You know, what made America great, at least for white Americans, uh, were people like my father and the fact that he belonged to a union. There was a downside to that. In 1960, I, through the 1950s and 1960s, I remember my father going on periodic strikes. You know, I remember these huge jars of peanut butter that the union used to give to the families of people who were in strike. Um, they went on one strike too many. And uh, the factory closed down and said, we're out of New York. We don't want these New York unions. And they moved south. Um, my father. Larger historical trends. He had to look for another job. He's 48 years old, has an eighth grade education, speaks with a heavy Norwegian accent. Um, very hard work. I mean, you could, just, you could just look at him and you knew. My dad, he was a, he could work. He could build anything. Uh, and um, he eventually got a job 
working for the New York City subway system, fixing subway trains. He moved from manufacturing to the service sector. Again, this transformation that's occurred in America, larger, larger historical changes, and here this personal, uh, personal experience matters. Day four. That's me posing next to the Hudson River Valley. We went from Mechanics Hill up to Lake George. Um, this was a bad day. This makes my looking, laying down on the side of the road on the first day look like a piece of cake. This was the second or third day when the heat and humidity was over 100. Um, and I just got to the point, we, we, we started out great. The first, how many miles did we do that day? We did four, first, first 33, 34 miles. I was, you know, I was ready, I was going, and then, um, it didn't go so well. Um, I uh, hit the wall. Uh, not physically, uh, but you know, they, they talk about runners and the runner's wall. I hit, I hit the biker's wall. Uh, and here I'm fine. This is before we got to Glens Falls. We stopped on the you know, rails to trails, actually rails to a, a canal path to trail. Uh, we got to Glens Falls which is about 10 miles from uh, Lake George. The plan was to go for another 20 miles beyond Lake, uh, Lake George uh, and have our wives pick, up, pick us up and go back to the Hampton Inn in Lake George. Uh, but we got to uh, that Hampton Inn around 1.30. It took us an hour and a half to go 10 miles, which was not what we were doing ordinarily. I walked a lot. My stomach was, I won't tell you what my stomach was doing. And I, we got there. We stepped into the air conditioning of the lobby. We said, can we check in? They said, yes. And the both of us went to our rooms. David took a bath. I took a shower. Uh, in our separate rooms, we just lay down in bed, dead. Um, it was just, it was, um, and so I Googled on, you know, that's a great thing. I Googled heat wave August 2018 uh, and uh, this map popped up, and you can see that was that day. Uh, um, biking several days in a row in that kind of heat, those kinds of distances, uh, it, just, it just did me in. I'd already made adjustments. I had to make uh, even more adjustments. Again, larger dramatic changes in history, uh, climate change. Um, now, you cannot blame specific historical, uh, excuse me, specific meteorological events on, on climate change, but I'm blaming this one. Uh, because I feel it made a difference. I actually looked it up. In 1968, uh, and you can use a website online uh, to locate myself on the Hudson River Valley all the way up, the temperature never got above 80 on the entire bike ride in 1968. That's the, yeah, that's the temperature. Uh, I also compared, uh, compared August 1968 with August 2018 in Central Park. The average temperature in Central Park was 83 in 1968. Average dew point, I don't know how much you know about dew points, but the average dew point was 59, which is absolutely comfortable. And in August 2018, the average uh, temperature was 87. That's a big, important difference. And the dew point, the average dew point was 69. And anything over 70 is wretched. And high 60s is miserable. Uh, climate change, larger, larger transformations, larger things in this world, historical change uh, that has had uh, a direct impact on me. That was what? Uh, you can see the 17-year-old Paul Gillia outperforms the 67-year-old. And that was by design. A weather front came in. We drove up to, uh, to Lake Champlain. We just biked 37 miles. We got to a point uh, towards the end of the day. We tried, we're trying to make a ferry to go across the Lake Champlain. And we just 
contacted our wives and said, we'll meet you at the Shelburne Museum, which is where they were, and we drove up to Burlington together. It was a great day. I was feeling much better. Uh, we didn't start until like 12 o'clock. We slept in, we hydrated, we got ready, and of course the temperature was 30 degrees different, uh, which is a significant, uh, uh, significant difference. Briefly, because I'm, I'm watching the clock, uh, communication was different. In 1968, every night, one of us would find a phone booth. And for the young people, that's a phone booth over there, if you don't, have never seen one. Uh, this is what a phone booth looks like. They used to be everywhere. Um, and one, one of us would call our parents, uh, collect, and then that parent, because phone calls were very expensive like that in 19... Uh, 60s in 1968, and so we'd call, and that parent would then relay a local call to the other two parents, and that's how we kept communication, uh, and that was it. Whereas in 2018, I have my iPhone, my daughter, who's in Alberta, Canada, uh, over the phone, walked me through getting the kind so you can always be tracked. Uh, so she was tracking me. So here I am. Uh, and this was a couple of days earlier in Rhinebeck, New York. We were sitting in this bagel shop, and my phone goes ding. I look at it, my daughter goes, Hi, Dad, are you enjoying your bagel? <laughs> it's like, okay. You know, not only did she know I was in Rhinebeck, she knew I was in a bagel shop. It's incredible. Uh, just think what the, F the FBI is doing. Uh, um, GPS, we use GPS we, we, instead of a map, and here's an you know, uh, old style map. Uh, we had a GPS. GPS, you have, sometimes you have to trick the GPS. We got a little lost sometimes. Uh, when we pulled into Virgins, uh, Vermont, the GPS said, um, make a left at the uh, mobile gas station, and there was no mobile gas station. Uh, we passed the point, and then we had to go back, and we looked, and oh, it's now a Valero station. Uh, so the GPS, sometimes you have to, have to uh, uh, outsmart it. Day six, uh, we were approaching the border. I said, David, we can't take any pictures at the border. Uh, I don't know if it was legal or not, but I didn't want to be arrested. <laughs> uh, and we purposely only went to Napierville. and then, then, um, We stopped here, and that night my wife turned to me and said, said you know, I really don't want to, she said, this was her, her speaking, I really don't want to drive in the traffic in Montreal. Would you drive into Montreal? And I thought for about a, a nanosecond. My wife, who gave up her entire summer, because when I was out doing those 1,200 miles, we weren't doing other things. My wife, who was picking me up every day, my wife who looked at me, and, you know, when I, there were times she looked at me and said, are you sure you want to finish this? Uh, I said, sure, just as long as we get through Canada and we got to, uh, and we did some miles, and it was fine. Um, and David was David was a wonderful running partner, uh, he, uh, a riding partner, I should say. He gave him, uh, never argued about any anything. But again, you can see the 17-year-old self and the uh, and the 67-year-old uh, self. Um, the border. We were oblivious. 17-year-old. We get to the border, um, and this is, of course, the height of the Vietnam War. We had about 600, in the United States had about 600,000 troops in Vietnam. There were 300,000 young men who were drafted that year. Uh, 15,000 young men, maybe and some were young women, uh, were killed in Vietnam that year. Uh, this, were, this is what you lived with in 1968 and 69. Uh, and we get to the border, and the Port of Gods turn to us and say, are you coming to Canada to, to escape the draft? We said, we're 17. We're going to be high school seniors, maybe next year. <laughs> and, 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 and they let us through. But again, it's like the world, that, be, that world, that, that horror that Americans lived with on the television set was brought to us, you know, even amidst the, this, uh, this trip. So my hope, and it didn't happen, because this was a period of intense trade negotiations last, last year in 2018 between Canada and the United States. Uh, better days for Trudeau than recently. If you have been following the news, he's hit some political bumps. Um, 
And you know, Trudeau stands as this great liberal, and there he is with this other person. Uh, and I was hoping, I was hoping uh, that the Canadian at the border would say, are you some senior citizen who's escaping to Canada to get away from Trump land, who's looking for our social, being protected by our social programs? Uh, what would have been a wonderful parallel, uh, but unfortunately, uh, it uh, did not. Uh, it did not happen. I'm almost done. Uh, so that's the uh, totals for the ride. That's a beautiful picture of a, a church. In I mean, it looks like French Canada, right? Uh, and I just it, I, I just love that. Notice our shirts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that we we did that on, on purpose. And look at him. Look. Would you think he could outride me? <laughs> he did. Uh, <laughs> he did. Um, Two slides left, more serious. Um, in, uh, in the week before Labor Day in 2018, uh, there were two, well, actually, there were many deaths, three that affected me. One was a very close personal friend who died, and I got that news when I was on the ride, and I, just, I was just like, this, this is just not fair. The world is not fair. Uh, this woman died of cancer. It was very, very upsetting, um, but also, John McCain died and Aretha Franklin died. And I, I just think that was very symbol, symbolic, um, a transition of eras. John McCain, who, was, who in that week I was in, uh, in, on the bike ride in 1968, was in prison, uh, uh, a prisoner of war in, um, in North Vietnam, probably was being tortured that week. I don't know for sure. I'm guessing that, you know. He was tortured intermittently while he was, while, while he was, a, uh, while he was a prisoner of war. Um, you know, and he dies. So they, from the, sort of on the, on the right, uh, on the right. Uh, and of course, Aretha Franklin died, uh, supporter of civil rights. Um, when she heard, not that it was her song per se, she didn't write it, but her singing of A Natural Woman became emblematic of the women's movement. Um, and, and she died, and I really thought about that a lot. Uh, which brings me um, to my concluding slide, and I'm going to read to you a paragraph again. Forgive me for reading, but I love this little paragraph, and, um, and I have a picture. There we are in Canada, and there we are drinking flights of beer, of uh, Quebec beer. I didn't have a beer the entire week uh, because I was afraid of dehydration. Um, Looking back to 1968, I now understand that my ride represented a major transition in my life. There was no single moment, no specific rite of passage. Yet by undertaking um, the bike ride, by venturing forth with Roger and Dennis, I was marking my own independence and my shift from childhood to adulthood. It also provided me with a great story to tell. For decades, I could refer to that ride and retell episodes from that adventure. I consciously embraced the 2018 ride with David as another major transition in my life. Again, there was no single moment, no special rite of passage. Yet by seizing on the opportunity to repeat the Odyssey, just as I was moving from the life as a, of a tenured professor to a whatever comes after that, uh, I was marking another great shift in the cycle of life. I now have new stories, some of which you've heard today, uh, to tell and retell. In 1968, I had a lifetime of great adventures in front of me. In 2018, and I should say in 2019, I recognize my own mortality. I know that my strength has already begun to ebb, um, and that I only will grow weaker with time. Not to get overly dramatic, but death awaits us all. The ride reminded me of that. It also reminded me that I still have a lifetime of adventures to come. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we open it up to questions, and as is the tradition at the forum, the first question is to a student. 
Uh, thank you very much. I truly enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Uh, just a, a quick question. So could you tell, tell me a little bit how the way people talk in this country change from maybe people, do you think people would be more polite or they try to use longer sentences? Um, the biggest transformation, and I won't be explicit um, in uh, the language, and I certainly won't be explicit with the crucifix in the room, um, is profanity. Um, that, uh, and I've actually written about this. Uh, I've actually studied this. Um, and I, in the book I wrote called To Swear Like a Sailor, I talk a little bit about this. Uh, the use of the F word uh, and other kinds of profanity uh, has just proliferated in a way and again, this is one of those, and I, th I thought a lot about, that, about this because um, people think, you, you know, you watch some television shows and they show people in the 19th century uh, banding around with that language. Didn't happen in the 19th century. Uh, the word existed, um, but it was not used that way. It was used as a coarse description of sexual whatever, right? Uh, and um, uh, so I would say that's the biggest difference uh, is the use of profanity as, you know, in, in the common par parlance to the point where, you know, males, females, uh, Wall Street brokers, lawyers, uh, poor people, rich people, uh, it's that use of profanity that really, uh, and, and not to sound like some old geezer, I find it disturbing. Uh, I guess I am some old geezer. Good question. Thank you. Hi, this is more just a general question on some of your works. Uh, for my historiography paper last semester, I cited The Road to Mabocracy as like one of my most profound sources. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, one of the questions I had was that how, while you were at Brown, were you influenced uh, by Gordon Wood in your writings about the New Republic? That's a great question because uh, actually Gordon Wood does an entirely different kind of history uh, than, I, than I do, right? Because Gordon Wood is a political, intellectual historian. Uh, he once turned to me and said, <laughs> I was up here in Providence uh, doing manuscript research, he says, he doesn't do manuscript research, he just reads published sources. Uh, um, but actually, as it turns out, uh, Wood has written a little bit about riots. Um, and I began studying riots in my uh, first year of graduate school. I went to, I was in a seminar with him, and he was listing a bunch of, uh, a bunch of topics that he said he didn't think anybody really investigated. And he said, no one has really investigated uh, riots in the early republic. And I sat there saying, I'm from Brooklyn. I could do riots. Uh, so there's one thing. The other thing is, um, something I've already brought up here, is, oh, and that my, I had very good college teachers, but it didn't sink in or they didn't make the same point. Wood was always talking about the importance of looking at history and looking at for what changed. Um, and one of the things that I, when I was working with when I was talking about riots, you read the road to Bobocracy, you know, is I talk about a transformation in riots. Um, and so that sort of conceptual framework of thinking about the nature of history and how, what the historical process meant. And what does it mean to tell an historical story a historical story is not just telling you stuff about the past. It's, t it's stuff about the past which is, has an argument, and that argument, he always would, would say, uh, and he taught me, was um, to focus in on change through time. Oh, other questions? Great, great question. Not about what I was doing here, but, but you can see the same conceptual framework that I had. I really appreciated your talk. Uh, I, I, I see the, the familiarity of going down well-worn paths in, in the course of six days from New York to Montreal. Uh -huh. uh, you're back in your old stomping grounds here in Providence. Yes. Uh, what have you noticed that uh, 
uh, rhymes with what you've presented over the last hour, like revisiting your old your old paths. Like, what what are you seeing in the changes in the larger forces that are at play here? Uh, specifically, you mean about Providence? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Providence is a very different city now than it was in the 1970s. One, Buddy Cianci is not mayor, <laughs> although he's still on the news. Uh, I always, I loved the Providence I lived in in the 1970s. Um, I loved being in Providence. Actually, you know, one of the things I loved about Providence in the 1970s, and it's probably still true today, is uh, you can get on a bicycle. And I should say I bicycled all my life. I mean, this trip was not, yeah. Yes, I didn't do the miles that David was doing, but I commuted on a bicycle. I've done many decent-sized bicycle rides, even in more recent past. Um, you get on your bicycle. I get on my bicycle. I live, you know, about a mile and a half from uh, from Brown, and in 20, 30 minutes, I was out of the city, uh, which I loved uh, because I grew up in Brooklyn. And in 20, 30 minutes, you get on a bicycle. You're in Brooklyn. <laughs> Another 20, 30 minutes, you're in Queens or Manhattan. Another 20, 30 minutes, you're maybe lucky if you're in the Bronx. Uh, I, so I love that ability of just getting on a bicycle and just getting uh, getting out of the city. Um, it's a much more re revitalized place. Uh, you know, the Providence River was nothing back then. Um, so it's a more dynamic place. It's more of a bedroom community than it used to be. People, you know, commute up to Boston. Um, so there are things like that. Uh, um, but I don't have... I've been here for, since yesterday. I went for a run this morning. I dragged this old body out for a run this morning. Um, if you can call what I was actually doing running um, uh, along the river. But I haven't seen that much of, of Providence. Brown has changed a lot. It's a, it has expanded a, a lot. Uh, and the history department's moved. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. I was wondering if you could comment on the safety between 1968 and 2018. Specifically, I can see that in 2018 now we have helmets, mirrors, specialized um, shoes. You're using um, a lot of bike paths as opposed to road. There were very few bike paths, if any, in, I don't think there were any in 1968. So did you feel safer in 2018 or in 19, well, I mean, maybe look, you didn't know in 1968, but what was your perception of safety? Look, when I, 1968, I was 17. I didn't think about the safety issues. Um, I was much more conscious of those, and, and we chose some of our routes um, purposely, I chose the route purposely to maximize when I could uh, being on rails, uh, rail, uh, rails to trails. Um, so so that, that's a transformation. You're right about the rails to trails. I mean, I was watching the clocks. So I didn't go on and on about the rails to trails. I, I have statistics um, um, that uh, the first rails to trails actually begin in like late, in Wisconsin, I think, in the late 1960s, but they really don't expand until like the mid to late 70s, um, in part because federal funding came in behind it. And now, of course, there's a plan to try to make a rails to trails all the, all, all the way across the United States, which I will not bike. Uh, I still like, I still bike, not so much this summer because I hurt my hands early this year, early this summer. I tripped when I was running. Haven't fully healed a couple months later, and you need your hands to ride. Um, but uh, our outfits, you know, the helmet. I, I I could have used the helmet when I was running and tripped this earlier this summer, but I never I've never needed the helmet um, while biking. But I made sure I always wore a helmet. There was one point when I was 17 that I, I did get a little scared, um, and that was. Um, Part of the road that we skipped this time near Lake George, halfway up Lake George, there's a, um, a mountain hill called, I think, Two Mile Mountain or Three Mile Mountain, and it's appropriately named. You're, and you're climbing up in two or three uh, uh, That's the only hill we walked up in when I, when I, when I was 17. 
going down it. We were going very fast. And, I'm, and, and you know, Dennis and Roger were on the tandem, and it was a heavier, more stable bike. Uh, and I actually started applying my brakes because I was afraid I was going, uh, going, uh, going too fast. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the big thing. I'll let you. I think we have time for one more question. I noticed the difference in prices between the bikes in the two years. Uh, would you say that the top bikes from 68 to uh, 2018 have increased in price faster than inflation? And do you think they're worth it? Well, first of all, I don't know if they're worth it. Uh, you can pay $10,000 easily for a bike. I didn't, you know, that, that's, we, I wasn't going there. I was willing to spend money on this trip. That was the other thing about being 67 and retired. And, you know, I have money. I, I'm not rich, you know. But I have enough money to do this without even. I actually have a chapter in the book uh, about economy. It's, it's modeled on uh, the chapter on economy in Henry David Thoreau's Walton Pond. Uh, this is the kind of thing you do when you're a historian. You, oh, uh, especially because he mocks old people who save money to retire. And I mock him. <laughs> for, wait a second, I'm an old person, I save money and I can do it, you know. Um, so I, 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 I counted up how much money I spent then, how much money I spent now. Uh, inflation from that period to today, from 68 to 2018, uh, seven times. Um, so it, 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 that's the, I don't, as an historian, I'm not crazy about inflation indexes because uh, a loaf of bread might go up at a certain percentage. A car might go at a certain percentage, and then not that seven per a house could be different. You know, my my father's house uh, in was worth when, in 1968 about thirty six thousand dollars, which was a good amount of money in those days. But uh, it sold recently for about a million dollars. Um, so yeah, it's a, that's not seven times. Uh, so it's, 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 it's care, uh, you know, you have to be careful about that. Um, being on a good bike makes a difference. There, was, uh, there, there were times on the road, I'd look at David on his road bike, and he was coasting and I was pedaling. I'm going, no wonder I'm struggling. <laughs> so um, it just depends, you know. You can, it depends what you want and, and, uh, and what, you, what, what you want out of a bike, really. And it's, Um, speaker, again, I want to have to, uh, I want to make two announcements. First, immediately after this, will uh, there are there's a reception outside with food and drinks. So please join us to talk uh, in a more casual setting about this. Uh, the second thing, and I, I'm, I think you have copies of the book. I have if, a few copies. Of the book. A few copies of the book. If anyone is interested in seeing this book. Uh, I, I will sell you the book. Uh, you will sell the book. So I wanted well, to make sure to get the plug in. For, the plug is, um, I self-published this book. This is the only book I've ever self-published through Amazon. And it's on Amazon for $11.95. Um, and uh, I have some copies of the book which I'll sell for $10 a piece because it's easy, you know, if anybody wants it. I don't want to deal with eleven ninety-five. You know. Well, let's thank Paul Kilhay again. And I'll even sign the book for you, so. Which has got to make it worth so much more money. <laughs>